He served as Kentucky Poet Laureate from 1999 until 2001. He likes to kayak and is a member of a group of kayakers calling itself the Church of Elkhorn after nearby Elkhorn Creek. He is also the author of Rare Bird and Fading into Bolivia. Please help me welcome Richard Taylor. Thank you, Katerina for bringing all of us together and for the many things you do for many in this room. It occurred to me as I listened to Kathleen's poem about buffaloes that writing poems is like attempting to herd buffaloes. You can lead it anywhere it wants to go. But sometimes, unfortunately, Poems don't go anywhere, and this first poem, it's really the title poem from this chapbook that Katerina published called Fading Into Bolivia, is about not writing. It's called Writing Slump, and its last line is uh, borrowed from my, from my mother. Writing Slump. As I drive to work, the sky is void as though the clouds have seceded to compose their own republic of rain. The red fox that scurried across the road last week, the one I've been saving for a poem, insists she's only a red fox. Even the puddles from yesterday's shower, metallic and flat as spatulas, shrug off light and hold the shadows hostage. I imagine my son's stolen Honda being dismantled in some chop shop, an automotive diaspora, its disc player surgically transplanted, radials married to a pickup, say in Alabama, hubcaps migrating to some Valhalla of chrome. Something will come, I tell myself. Still, the mimosa holds its tongue, its punker pink blossoms speechless. In an act of unwitting collaboration that describes her state and mine, my mother calls to say, some days I feel I'm fading into Bolivia. Home repairs. Measuring for a new countertop of black granite. Studying paint charts and testing six subtle shades of avocado on the kitchen wall. Replacing naked fluorescent tubes with a natty overhead in the style of Art Nouveau. Shoring up the side porch to bring it into plumb, erasing swags along the roof line. My wife is making so many improvements, I don't sleep well at night. <laughs> Katerina mentioned uh, kayaking. It's just a poem, sort of drawing a comparison between kayaking and, and relationships. Like kayaks, they float best when kept nose to the current, buoyant and free of drift. When they dip and take on water, they wobble and won't respond, which paddling hard won't alter. Unable to maneuver past rocks under raking limbs, through swells, unable to write or seek new channels, impossible to bail in choppy water when listing. They tump or founder, everything inside coming out, everything outside coming in. 
Thank you. The last poem is, is a poem called New Year, the last poem of this book. I'm going to read a couple from, uh, from the book on John James Audubon. New Year. On a shelf in the pantry, I save all the dinnerware I've broken during the year. A handleless ceramic mug, a plain but favored butter dish, a tulip-shaped wine glass severed from its stem, flowers hand-painted around its bowl. Though I know I'll never restore them, never probably try, and that no glue will form a bond to withstand the tensions of dishwater or even ceremonial use, still I stack them, china casualties, toward an hour when all that breaks is mended, when all the fragments that pile in seamless shards and little cairns of dust will, like unpaired socks and fractured hearts, reincorporate with perfect wholeness. Uh, Grace Heights, uh, last year published a collection called Rare Bird, and these are rough sonnets, and I, I do mean rough, based on the life of, of John James Audubon. And Audubon's wife, a, a number of poems in the book are about his wife, actually, who supported him for years, who raised their children, often when he was in absentia, and uh, as he went to Europe to promote and, and gain subscriptions for his book. And this is a, a poem uh, called Dalliance. As far as we know, Audubon was faithful to his wife, though he had a, uh, a kind of unending uh, attraction uh, to, to ladies. I do not miss a miss if fair wherever I go. J.J. had the brass to write his wife guileless, overconfident, or blind about the way his slap across an ocean must have reddened Lucy's cheek as she read while washing his children's clothes or tutoring or simply sitting on an empty porch staring at the wall of lushness beyond, especially a prominent live oak whose strands of choking moss she might once have seen as festive. Who knows what pillow talk they had, what compact of the heart. Flirtations must have seemed to her a wound, to him another form of selling, skirts an affirmation of a self uncertain. This is the last poem in the book. It's a, uh, I guess it's an attempt to come to some understanding of, of J.J.'s or, or Audubon's ambiguous relationship with nature. Here's a person who, impelled to preserve life uh, through painting pictures, uh, shot a number of, uh, you know, shot up to a hundred uh, birds of each species he painted in some instances um, and gave rise, as you know, not only to the National Honor Society, but the bird group here in Lexington, the uh, Lexington Audubon Society, which is older, in fact, than the National Honor Society, the National, excuse me, Audubon Society. The natural scheme of things. J.J. saw nature as a kind of bank in which each deposit and withdrawal upheld a touchy balance. Take his purple grackles that pillage unripe corn, their subtle hues, a silky iridescence that paint can never replicate, or banditry's pageant. 
Through his cracked bill, the male raises exultant squawks, his nestmate perched on huskings of a ravaged ear, her beak pinching one filched kernel for her brood. Mindful of the bird's nefarious propensities, J.J. marvels at the play of light, a gloss unfolding from coppery bronze to azure, from sapphire to emerald green in synergies that stun. In this equation, beauty forgives marauding as an act of necessary plunder, simple commerce, as if to say, borrow, lend. Thank you.